Hi everyone, thanks for coming out this evening. I apologize for interrupting the conversation. Uh, my name is Daniel Lang. Um, good to see all the new faces here tonight, thanks. So, uh, and also thanks for coming out on such a blistery cold night in December. So, for tonight, um, and I just want to make sure I get it all right. So we have Richard McGuire from... Bullington McGuire. Uh, I apologize, Bullington McGuire. My, my wife and I hyphenated. <laughs> no, she wouldn't take my name, I wouldn't take her. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Uh, so Richard uh, Bullington McGuire, uh, he's been a software developer for the past, you know, 25 years plus, and in the last seven years he's been doing some pretty heavy DevOps, and sorry, the company is Modus, right? Modus Create. Uh, Modus Create. Um, so tonight he's going to talk about creating images with Packer, and which is really great, I'm sure everyone's done this, but what he's going to hopefully show us is some of the best practices, and also kind of give us the heads up on, watch out for this, this is where you might fall over. Um, before he starts though, just a couple of notes. He said, uh, Richard said he's totally happy taking questions during the presentation. I ask everyone to obviously keep them simple and, and uh, if you have a really long question, we can take it at the end. Um, and I also want to thank uh, Rapid SOS tonight for hosting us, uh, second time. Um, Gabe is an engineer at Rapid SOS and wanted to tell you about Rapid SOS for a moment. So thanks Gabe and uh, after that, Richard. So thanks everyone and enjoy the, enjoy the presentation. Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Gabe Mahoney. I'm an engineer at FSOS here. I've been here for about two and a half years, and I work on our data location services team, which takes cell phone location from um, it's about 200,000 calls a day from iOS and uh, Android phones, and it goes into what we call a clearinghouse, and we make that location available for uh, 911 dispatchers when you make a 911 call to their dispatch center. Um, so the people making 911 calls who maybe can't be found, who don't know where they are, um, can be dispatch to and help save their lives. So, yeah, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. I just wanted to uh, share a little bit of what I've learned about using Ansible in image bakery patterns. Just something that has really accelerated and made the software deployments that I've worked on over the last couple of years way more stable and gives you a lot of flexibility if you do it right. But there are a lot of cliffs you can fall off in the middle of this also. So I've worked with uh, continuous integration and, and continuous deployment for a long time. Uh, and in the last few years, i uh, worked a lot with Ansible. Uh, a colleague introduced me to this a few years ago. And I've been doing a lot of stuff with Chef. I've done a little bit of stuff with Puppet. And I picked this up just like that. I thought it was a really uh, simple and direct way of expressing many of the provisioning concepts, you know, the top to bottom thing, you know, with fewer surprises than some of the other frameworks is really appealing to me, especially when I need to work with a team, you know, and it can't be too mysterious why things end up the way they end up. And I've seen that with a lot of other frameworks. So, in the last couple of years, I've used, uh, I used Ansible uh, both in the, the way that I think it's sort of originally intended to be used as, hey, we have a network inventory and we need to run a set of scripts on some subset of these hosts. Okay. And I've done that with, uh, with Ansible, a little bit of that with Chef, and I just find it like, like awkward sometimes about like, oh, well, you have to reach out and mess with the state of something that's out there. Okay. That flies in the face of some of the recent innovations in space, especially about immutable deployments. Okay, this is one of the holy grails that a lot of people in the DevOps world are looking at now. How can I get one image that I just put somewhere and then I deploy and it auto-configures based on how its environment is set up and then my application runs and scales perfectly. Okay. In the real world, there's often a lot of other concerns that make that very difficult. Sometimes there are applications that have been built over the course of five or ten years. They have messy configuration files. You might have applications that are in five or six different language runtimes. And it can just be really hard to get those all the way to the auto-scaling 
immutable, containerized future, whether that's Kubernetes or AWS Fargate or something else. In light of that, one of the things that has sort of been one of my specialties over the last couple of years is figuring out how to take legacy applications and get them up and running on scalable cloud infrastructure. Because many people are still struggling with deploying their applications in their own data centers or sometimes on premises, sometimes you know, in a uh, colo space, sometimes they deal with uh, rack space or some other hosting provider and you know, it's just being able to, to get some provider that lets you configure resources through an API and then scale out is where you want to go. Even if you can't make it all fully dockerized and perfectly immune. And the image bakery pattern has a place even when you can't get all the way down that path or it would just be too expensive to do that. So I did a really large migration last year uh, that I'll uh, show a little bit more about later on that involved Ansible and Packer and Jenkins and Code Deploy, auto scaling groups, all that. So what I've tried to do is build a demo that has all of those parts in it. And I got about mm, maybe 85 to 90 percent of the way where I wanted it to be, but I didn't get that last 10 percent in time for the meeting. So what's in here is work in progress, and all of you get to help me figure out how to knock down the next couple barriers during the meeting. So I knew we were here for a reason. That's right, you're here for a reason. So with with Ansible and the image bakery, there there are a few things you can do that will really help. I'm sorry, can you just clarify what you mean by image bakery? Okay, image bakery pattern is something where you have a system that takes source control artifacts, okay, like something that will pull from GitHub. That could be any continuous integration server. Okay, there are systems. Netflix has built uh, a system that is specialized that just does image bakery continuous integration. But really, you can do this kind of pattern with any sort of continuous integration system, or even your own set of scripts. But the key thing is that at some point, it's going to spit out a machine image or file system image of some kind that is composed of a bunch of smaller parts that are expensive to assemble. Okay. So this, this pattern, when, it, when it's taken to its logical conclusion, you may actually use an image bakery pattern to come up with a machine image that has all of your configs baked into it and all of your application baked into it. So all you got to do is say, give me the latest image with this tag and, and you can run without doing any configuration. But it's, it can be really difficult to get some applications all the way down that path. You can also bake kind of a golden baseline image. And this is the path that I used in the, in the large cloud migration last year where you know, a client had applications in four or five major languages and they needed to be able to apply security controls in a consistent way. So you know, the trade-off was have to go fast. So build a golden image that has all of the language runtimes in it and has all the security controls in it. And then just package the applications that in, a, in, a, in a small way so that you can have relatively small application packages that can be deployed quickly, as well as the, the baseline image uh, that you know, takes a long time to bake that you can deploy. You, you can build that more slowly. And you, know, you can do your operating system patches <coughs> with the baseline image. You can do security remediation with the baseline image. And if you look at uh, my LinkedIn, you'll find slide shares on a couple previous presentations that I've done with the same repo that talk about doing security remediation with the CIS baseline and also about managing expensive and destructive operations uh, using Jenkins and what, kind of, what, what some of the, th the checks and balances are that you can do. And I'll, I'll demonstrate a bit of that while, while I'm going through this, but I'm not going to focus on either of those things, remediation. I actually disabled the part of this that, uh, that installs a bunch of security controls uh, because I knew it would be a problem at some point, and I never got to the point where I re-enabled that. Like, I'm actually going to show a couple of the, the security problems or the, the operational problems about using Ansible that happen when you, when you mix some of that up. Um, yeah, is there, uh, that answer your question? Very basic, very, very basic. Sure. What is Python? 
Okay, Packer is a tool from HashiCorp, and it takes a, manif a JSON manifest file that describes uh, what scripts you need to run and what cloud you're going to run it on, and uh, takes your scripts, executes it in the cloud or with whatever virtual machine system you have, and it will spit out machine images on the other side. So this can, you can configure this to, to spit out Amazon machine images for EC2. You can also have it uh, spit out VMware boxes. You can have it spit out a Vagrant box. You can have it spit out a Docker uh, image. Now it's very, very flexible, and it has support for more than a dozen different image formats. So this is, this is the essential tool in the image bakery pattern. So if you marry up some continuous integration system, like I've got Jenkins in this demo, and some image baking system, and I've got Packer in here, and some cloud, or some execution environment, could be VMware, you know, running on a box under your desk for that matter. But if you have that, then you can, you can do that image bakery, and you can get some or all of the software uh, pre-baked into the image, okay? So the, the process of creating the image is, you know, casually known as baking it, so. Would you say it's a competing thing for Terraform? Okay, Terraform is complementary to this. Okay, Terraform, uh, like CloudFormation, and the, like AWS CloudFormation is a way of defining what all of your cloud resources are going to be. And it's one of several different domain-specific languages for different clouds that do something similar. Like there's a similar system for Microsoft uh, Azure, there's a similar system for Google uh, Compute, there's a similar system for dealing with VMware. Uh, I'm not nearly as familiar with any of those. I know a bit of cloud formation. But Terraform is another HashiCorp tool that, you know, in the family of, you know, Vagrant, Packer, Terraform, uh, uh, Vault, uh, several others, console, that, you know, these cloud management tools. So Terraform has a, a language, a uh, HashiCorp configuration language, and I can show a little bit of that too, as it's relevant to looking some of this stuff together. Uh, that allows you to define sets of resources for multiple cloud providers. So the, the demo that uh, this repo backs up has mostly AWS, but it stores one image on Google Cloud for example. So you can actually mix and match the clouds and you can define a multi-cloud deployment okay. using Terraform. So, and I, I think it's one of these tools, uh, like Ansible gives you a slightly higher level, mm, very well-defined model for how you might do certain of these operations. Terraform does the same sort of thing for defining network resources, machine specifications, all of the, the cloud elements. Now you can even use it to uh, define configurations in tools like Datadog or New Relic. Okay. So like the next talk I'm, I'm gonna do in the spring is going to be about using Terraform to configure New Relic to monitor uh, an application. Probably the very one that I'm messing with now. Okay, uh, I'm showing how that's done. Other other questions before I keep going here? Okay. Um, so the, the key thing, if, if you're if you're going to do an image bakery, is you want to put as much as you can into that first stage, the one where it spits out the biggest part of your image. So if you need to do an operating system update, do it while you're baking the image. Don't do it after you spawn the uh, the instance, you know, and, and before it's ready to serve traffic, okay. um, If you have huge Ansible playbooks or huge scripts, you want to split them into smaller units that could stand alone that you can test independently. This is, this is really important. Your Ansible playbooks may have a lot of redundant things in them, like, oh, I have to tell it that I need these five packages. And then there's somewhere else where it's like, oh, I need to tell it I need these three packages. And that's a huge pain until you have to test those separately. You can do stuff if you define these to stand alone, like hoist the, uh, hoist the roll to the top of your playbook, and then it'll run immediately. And that shortcuts the amount of time you have to do when 
when you're trying to debug these things. Another super time saver is to use some lower environment on your own PC, like Vagrant or Docker, to test, to test the playbooks. If you do this, then you don't have to go through the relatively expensive and sometimes time-consuming operation of spinning up an image on the cloud and you know, waiting for SSH to be available and, you know, it just, you can keep that image running and you can actually run the Ansible commands on it locally to debug things, you know, much more quickly. Like, it's all, when you're trying to, to do these, these bakery patterns and you're trying to do all these deployments, cycle time is your enemy. So anything you can do to shorten that cycle time is going to be a win. The other thing that really helps when you get into production scenarios is, is having testing in your image bakery pipeline for the built images. So the, the repo that I'm going to show you has uh, some tests. It uses Open SCAP to do a security scan. Uh, now, the production customer project has tests that are written in Test Kitchen, which is actually a chef product, but there is a lot of documentation out there about using Test Kitchen to test Ansible scripts too. So you're like, well, what do I need to test it for? Well, let's say when you bake your image, you want to make sure that it's not listening on the web server port when it starts up. Okay, you want to explicitly start up that web server with your with whatever scripts you're going to do uh, with Code Deploy or whatever other system. So you can you can put in a test that says, you know, expect the web server port to be closed when I boot the image up again. Uh, or you might have tests that say SSH in there and make sure that the AWS CLI uh, is working and I can get a security token or that I can retrieve an IAM role or something like that. There are a lot of different checks. You know, some of these can, can be done via uh, like a regression process where if you're building these things and you run into the problems, if you have something like Test Kitchen or another test suite in there, uh, you can do kind of a test-driven development. You could even like build the test before you build the feature. Like, oh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to add uh, a Redis server <coughs> to every image so that I can have a super fast local cache. That was a, a thing you needed to do for some reason. You could write a test that says, expect the Redis server to be listing on this port run a command to set a key and, and clear it, something like that. Okay. So at a high level, these are the things that have really helped me to, to build better, better playbooks when I'm doing image bakery stuff. The real pitfalls are about uh, race conditions and uh, a fail uh, item potency. And this, um, this is totally a reading vocabulary word for me. I may not be saying it correctly. If anyone knows how to say this better, please let me know. Okay. okay. So this, this is the other thing where item potency or an item potent operation is one where <clears throat> you repeat the operation and the system stays in the same state no matter how many times you apply it. So a good Ansible playbook should be item code. And if you run it twice on the same machine, it should result in the same state. That's usually what you want. But there are things that can really mess this up, especially when you're doing security lockdowns. You can get into a situation where, because of a security lockdown that you've done, it's no longer possible to install packages, or it's no longer possible to create a user, or it's no longer possible to execute a program sitting in the temp directory. Okay, has anyone ever set, uh, set their temp directory to no exec, no SUID? Okay, that's good practice, right? That's part of the CIS baseline. Well, guess what a ton of Ansible playbooks out there in Ansible Galaxy do, okay? They copy a file into temp and then execute it, okay? So when this happens, basically you need to fork it and change it so that there's a directory parameter, where do I copy this thing before I execute it, okay? The, there's a code deploy cookbook in this project right now that has not been fixed for that. Okay, so if I had like a whole other day, I would have fixed that problem and forked it too, but I didn't. So the temp directory is is a big nasty problem. There's also a lot of programs that 
rely on temp directories. A lot of legacy software where you have competing processes that use the temp directory to share information between them. This is a terrible, terrible, terrible idea, but it happens all the time. And with modern systems that use systemd, you may have a temp directory jail, so they may not even be the same temp directory. Okay? There's a, there was a, a race condition in provisioning scripts for AWS code deploy that, uh, that messed with the temp directory. They downloaded stuff into the temp directory to execute it. And it was noted that you know, this, this could end up with a race depending on when this script was run at boot up. You know, that temp directory might or might not be around you know, for the download, between the download and the execution. Um, and, and really, like, just making a change in the very last roll that's all the way down there, at the very bottom of your playbook, and then waiting an hour for your playbook to execute, like in the worst case, like, you don't want to do that. You want to make them small so that you can hoist it up to the top, test it fast, test it locally, and then move on. Um, so, I'm going, to, I'm going to show a few of these, I'm going to refer back to a few of these, especially with the, the tricks and the pitfalls in a minute here. Um, the, a lot of these systems, like Vagrant and Packer, have first-class support for multiple provisioning systems. They can run Chef, they can run Puppet, they can run Ansible. Don't do it, because most of them copy stuff straight into temp, and if you made your temp directory you know, no SUID, no exec, they just go, and they don't work anymore. Um, so, uh, there's, a, there's a little trick I'm going to show about copying the, uh, the script uh, with uh, Vagrant to a different directory so that you can execute it without having to try to run it in the slash temp. And that way you can keep your scripts idempotent even after you've done a security lockdown. Um, if you have a lot of Playbook entry points, you can use naming conventions to split up the complicated scripts. So, I'm going to show this in just a second. So, with this particular repo, uh, there's, there's, like, there's three or four different entry points to this. Just build this image and then install the software on it. So, I have a, I have a bakery YML uh, playbook that has a bunch of roles defined in it that will bake the baseline image. And then I have uh, several different playbooks that are related to uh, AWS code deploy that I use during the installation process of the software. Um, and about AWS code deploy, this is another thing. Like this, this is one of these uh, bits of software where deploying software can be hard. You can deploy software with just Ansible, but the rollback can be kind of hairy. Okay? So you know, a system like this that has a multiple phased uh, installation process that someone else manages for you can be really helpful in doing the deployments. And you can still use Ansible to, you know, or just plain old shell scripting, uh, whatever, whatever works best for the, the, the problem, to do the second stage of provisioning. So this repo has a second stage of provisioning for two code deploy phases for after install and for uh, the, the start hook. That, that use Ansible, uh, and, and using using uh, Jenkins or some CI process that you know is like in your in your organization to, to hook into uh, the bakery process, you know, is, is a great way to do it. Using Docker also to so that you don't have to install a whole lot of software on the local machines is also a huge win. So the, the repo that I'm going to show has. Dockerized uh, has Dockerized Packer and it has uh, Dockerized Terraform. So between those two, uh, it makes it super, super lightweight on the CI server. You don't have to install a whole bunch of stuff on your CI server. Do you run any Terraform and Packer inside Docker containers? Yes. That also lets you lock down exactly what you're going to use really easily. And you don't have to install a bunch of stuff. You don't have to sudo install a bunch of garbage on on the servers. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show a few of these tricks in the source here. Okay, so all right. Okay, 
So this repo, can folks see this okay? Yeah. Okay. So this, this has, this repo has several subdirectories uh, for the different components of it. It's got uh, an Ansible directory. Ansible gets called partly from Packer and partly from code deploy in this. It has a Terraform directory. The, uh, the Terraform stuff um, actually invokes uh, Ansible as well. Um, so, like, I did all Ansible all the time here, you know, as much as I could. You know, there's, there's a bunch of shell scripts in here, but I wanted to show that you could use this in multiple places to provide hooks to, to have a really powerful and flexible system to do configuration um, at multiple stages. So, you know, the, this, is, this one is, is all driven by this Jenkins file, okay? So at the top level, you want to use your CI system for as much of this as possible. So this Jenkins file has uh, the ability to selectively run several of these heavyweight processes. So when you just commit something, it's going to do some linting, and it'll do a build of the code deploy artifact, which is relatively quick and cheap, put an S3, and it's done. But if you want to run Terraform, or if you want to do a Packer run, and each of these might take a few minutes, you can you can come in and give it a uh, give it a uh, come on yeah there we go too many tasks I've only got 37 right now which is like the, the lowest it's been in a two months. Like, I killed my beloved tabs just for you people tonight. Okay, I had over 200 going last week. Wow. And, yeah. Your computer was very relieved. Very relieved, yes. Okay, so this particular project, uh, you know, on, on our Jenkins server, I have several different branches that are running here. Uh, this is not publicly accessible, uh, you know, as most of these things shouldn't be. Um, but I'll, I'll show a little bit about what happens when I build with parameters. Okay, it gives me some checkboxes for, you know, do I want to run Packer? This is like, do I want to initiate uh, an image bakery run? Okay, and I'll go ahead. And, I'm going to go ahead and check off some of these just to get get this started because I I think it's actually working. Do I want to rotate the servers? This, this uses an auto-scaling group once it's deployed its Terraform um, bits and pieces in AWS. And if you, want to, uh, if you want to use your refreshed image, you need to rotate the instances that are in your auto-scaling group. Because when you apply Terraform, it's not going to, to update any running instances. It's just going to change the, uh, the uh, auto-scaling group <coughs> Uh, configuration. So the um, the you know it, it like tees things up so the next time an instance is launched, it will use your new AMI and whatever new configurations that you may have applied. So to really get it all here, you know you, you want to do all three of these things, and then I have to solve the capture here. So in this case, this is a nice easy one. 3 plus 18 minus 3, and you know, there's a, I did a whole presentation on the safeguards, you know, behind this. If I solve the problem incorrectly, it'll just stop bold if I'm trying to do something, you know, destructive or potentially dangerous. Um, so this now is going to use, uh, you know, like a, all of these stages. Um, Are you using pipelines for this, yes. or is it uh, like a, run, a, a scripted job? No, this is all, uh, well, this is, this uses the, um, the scripted variant, okay? I don't use the, the pipeline stuff as much because this gives you more flexibility, but it's, it's a little harder to understand for people that are cold on it. So if you have a really relatively simple build job with Jenkins, I like, I like the, uh, the special DSL that they have for it, but you can't do a few things, okay? You can't 
define a function in your top level scope and then have something call it down below. So your scripts tend to be more verbose, it's a lot more boilerplate in them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, some of these tricks ended up being super useful, uh, like this wrap function where it makes sure that when I'm doing anything, anything like interesting in here, um, you know, I, I, I run the, uh, the, the wrap function around it and then I get ANSI color and I get all the credentials that I need to have in my environment uh, like and I get a, a clean uh, a clean build okay so and if, I, if you if you're using the, the other style you're going to have to put a lot of boilerplate in there or like have some scripts that do some of this stuff and you just can't do do some of it without repeating the boilerplate it's kind of annoying uh, or maybe I just don't understand how to do it. <laughs> no, I really I appreciate the captures because I feel like that could prevent a lot of drug computing. Yeah. Uh, I did a whole presentation on this, but people tend to, to wonder right through if you say, oh, type in override to deploy to production. Well, guess what? People always type override. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I, I've, I, I still deploy to production when I've had a system like this in place, but only a couple times by accident. <laughs> okay, but, but whereas with the other one, just all the darn time people would screw it up. So, um, so you know, the, the Jenkins drives all of this. So if we want to do uh, run Packer, um, we just run some simple shell scripts. So, you know, I like to structure things so that the Jenkins file is as simple as it can be, and then you have some shell scripts that then invoke the, the next stages. And that includes uh, shell scripts that you know, may invoke things that ultimately lead into Ansible land. So, um, <clears throat> I'm going to go back to this and about the presentation because there, there's a few very specific things here that I wanted to I wanted to show. Okay. All right. The break expensive operation into the bakery stage. Okay. Let's look at the Ansible directory here. Okay. So uh, I have a bakery file here in the Ansible uh, in the Ansible uh, directory here, and this calls several roles uh, that that get things ready to go. So I use the stock nginx role. I have a couple custom roles that prepare web content. Uh, which kind of gets the system ready and, and has all the uh, all the packages that are required for the next stages to go in here. And I also have one uh, that will uh, that will uh, deal with code deploy uh, and install that. So uh, stuff stuff that I have in the other demos, it's not baked into here. Is a you know, dealing with CIS remediation. There's a lovely Ansible playbook from MindPoint Group, which does some CIS baseline lockdown. Uh, AWS also has images that are already locked down that you could use as a starting point. So if you, you can use one of those AMIs, but you then have to be sure that your, your playbooks are going to play nice because some of them might do things like copy things into temp and try to execute them. So you're gonna hit a brick wall much faster. So one strategy that you can use is to run those things before you do your lockdown. So run all those sloppy, ugly, horrible stuff that you just pulled off the internet that is good enough before you do your lockdown, okay? And in the customer production one, there was an awful lot of that that happened before the lockdown scripts happened. And it's, it's fine, it's great, because when the lockdown scripts comes in, it, it does all the operating system updates, it makes sure SE Linux is engaged, it does a ton of different stuff to to really make things a lot tighter. But sometimes you don't, like, the, the scripts you have won't accommodate that. So put them before that. Um, so, the, the roles in here uh, are relatively straightforward. Uh, like, let's look at the code deployment, for instance. Okay. Um, you know, this um, this just makes sure that the, the prerequisite uh, bits and pieces uh, are here. Um, code deploy doesn't actually get installed in the um, 
in the bakery part. Okay? And this, this is one of those funny things. Okay? AWS does not recommend that you put AWS Code Deploy into a baked image because they update this frequently. And their system relies on the software that's there uh, being compatible with the server-side software they have. So if you do bake it in, it may, it may like save you some startup time, but you may find also that when your image starts up, Code Deploy won't talk to the Code Deploy servers anymore because your, your image has gotten too old. Uh, there's actually a, an update process uh, that goes on with Code Deploy where it tries to keep itself up to date for servers that are running for a long time. So it's, you know, like, you, you might have some increased availability because Code Deploy uh, is installed on your baseline image. You know, if, if the Code Deploy sources are broken, let's say S3 is having a bad day, you know. Uh, you can't pull down the, the, uh, the binary from, from that particular bucket. Well, that's great, you dodged that bullet, but you're gonna get hit by a lot of other bullets. So it's just trade-offs. So in this case, uh, Terraform actually in invokes a, uh, a different playbook, okay? Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, cloud init play, uh, playbook. And this one pulls in a, a, a code deploy agent script that, uh, that I got from uh, the uh, career builder fork of uh, the TELUS Ansible AWS code deploy agent. This is one of the very frustrating things. Like a lot of, you know, Ansible is moving fairly fast. So some of the stuff that might work, you know, now, if you kind of keep going, you keep upgrading your Ansible version, it might not work in the next version. Mm -hmm. This thing throws a lot of, like this set of scripts right now, throw a lot of deprecation warnings that as soon as we hit Ansible 2.11, this stuff's gonna break, okay? And this particular script, this Telus one, this broke, after 2.6, so you know, what's over that, you know, as soon as Ansible 2.6 came out, like uh, certain, there was a backward incompatible thing that had a deprecation warning in it for a long time, and it blows up. So pay attention to those deprecation warnings and try to root them out. And if you have to fork the packages and fix it and try to get it back upstream, please do. Um, so, um, so this role will install code deploy. This role doesn't get baked into the image. Instead, I use cloud init to, uh, to get that in there. So the, uh, let's see, yeah. So the launch configuration for the auto scaling group specifies user data from this cloud config template. Okay, which ends up being uh, the uh, so this ends up doing the the initial bootstrap right after the instance launches into the auto scaling group, and all it does is it invokes Ansible playbook, and this is a great trick. I, I love this trick. Like I hate having to be dependent on on external servers. And you know you, you can get it down as, as short as possible. So here I had a playbook that kind of paved the way for this by installing all of the RPM prerequisites. So it you know if it, if it checked to see if it needed to install pip and a few other packages, those were already present by the time this hit. So it doesn't have to do uh, like a, a yum update when when it's actually trying to install code deploy, which is great. So. You know, there's the first stage, Ansible, where you do the bakery in this case, and the second stage of Ansible use happens in cloud init when the instance comes up, and then there's a third stage, which is done through AWS Code Deploy, which actually puts the application onto the instances. Okay, and the, the, the application here is is really trivial. There's there's two parts to it, and today it's not fully wired up. But there's like a simple static website part, and there's a there's a Python app, a little WSGI app uh, that does nothing but spin the CPU for five seconds every time you hit it. So, you know the the intent, and this is going to be really instrumental in the next talk where I show the new Relic monitoring and 
how all that comes together, you know, about hitting this with load and scaling it and seeing how all that stuff reacts, um, is that you could use that to test your auto scaling. So, you know, you, you put load on it and the, the stuff in here is configured for it, but it is untested as of yet. So. Okay. So we've seen this about splitting huge playbooks into smaller units. Um, now I, I'm using Vagrant to, uh, to test these locally, okay? So I have a, a, I have a Vagrant file in there. You know, and some people like Vagrant, some people like Docker, use whatever you're more familiar with and that gives you the best lift or some other system. Just, you need some way of being able to test this stuff locally in a VM environment. It's going to be very similar to the execution environment that you're going to see when it's out there. And, you know, like, it's, it's a little ugly and messy in some places because, um, you know, from, from Ansible's perspective and from, like, Vagrant's perspective, you know, it's a little different environment than EC2. So sometimes you have to, you have to do things a little differently. And this is actually one of the things that's, that's breaking right now. Um, so, one of, the, one of the roles in here that I've got, uh, the after install role, does a little dance here where it sets either a virtual box fact or an EC2 fact, and it attempts to, uh, it attempts to, uh, to, you know, do the right thing for either VirtualBox or for EC2 based on that. You know, because with VirtualBox, there's a, um, you, you need to have um, a, the SE Linux set up a little differently than you do on EC2 because there's this, um, there's this directory that, um, that VirtualBox uh, has and you can, you could set the SE Linux context on it. Um, you know, but like you need to have an extra module in there. It's just kind of messy, okay? To get it to work and have SE Linux enabled in both environments required a little bit of finesse, okay? And right now, this is one of the things that's broken because, you know, the very last thing I added to this was a debug message because I'm expecting, um, I was expecting Amazon to be in the Ansible BIOS version. But it was not, the, not, out. The, not the newest newest image types. The like newest image image type, it's different. So like so the the like C fives, M fives, they don't report uh, Amazon in the BIOS anymore. Yeah, that's what I just found <laughs> out. Okay. So yeah, so I've had to. I'm five, still trying to figure the, that out. How to the five it. types then? That are, yeah. You know, yeah. So not anymore. So <laughs> guess what? All that stuff's broken. It relied on that. It's yeah. <laughs> working great. And I'm like, oh, I can switch this to T3, and that'll be better for a load test. Well, no. yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess the, the super quick fix would be to flip it back to T2 for, you know, for a simple test. Um, uh, but, you know, being able to use this, you know, like you, you can do things like uh, you can run, you can run, um, you can run the, the same command here, or variants on the command, to test one or, or you know, different uh, of these independently. So if I just want to test this playbook, you know, I could do that. Um, and it'll just do that little playbook. And that just, like, the cycle time again is, is such a killer with some of this stuff. Um, especially when you get distracted and start watching, you know, videos of cats or whatever it is that's going to uh, take you away and you're like, oh, what, was, what was I doing here? So just being able to keep it in that little short loop where you can keep, uh, keep flow is really important. Um, the, the, the temp bit, I'm going to show a tiny little bit of one of the, the, bad, uh, the bad temp bits, okay? So... Mm -hmm. It would be in Ansible. 
Here we go. So this Ansible AWS code deploy agent tasks and right destination temp code deploy install. Okay, no exact boom. This, this playbook will fail. So you know, rooting this kind of stuff out is you know difficult, but probably worthwhile. I, I often like just put it in the home directory of whatever user you know, gets SSH into, or have some some special directory in Oct or something that is like the designated dumping ground for stuff like that. Uh, it just works out better in the end. Um, so another one of the things that I was showing. See how I've got shell provisioner here and not and not the Ansible provisioner, it's because of that same temp thing. If, as soon as I enable that security role, like this will, this will stop being item potent because you know, the Ansible provisioner in Vagrant wants to copy stuff in the shell script into temp and then run it, so it goes boom. Mm -hmm. um, so instead, you know, because we know this is always in Vagrant, um, I just have the upload path uh, for that be you know, home Vagrant, mm -hmm. whatever. So, next up. Um, the provisioner that you were talking about, the Ansible provisioner, is that the local provisioner or are you doing the remote provisioner? So lo the local Ansible provisioner. I see, got it. Uh, copy stuff to temp some shell script, you know, some temp file that I say and runs it. So, got it. You know, yeah. um, and, you know the, the, same, the same thing. I feel really terrible because I always use the remote one. Because I, I, don't, I don't do any of my testing on. Yeah. I I omit that. I just I just basically spin up an instance and I just kind of crank at it. I mean, you can do that too. I mean that, like, but especially if you have like a distributed team and you know sometimes the network access can be a little spotty. It can be yep. a lot faster to just work something locally. Yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, there, there's other things where it's just too hard to get some of that stuff working locally. Like it's actually possible to get AWS code deploy working locally on the instance in Vagrant and have deploys go per user to that, okay? Mm -hmm. but, and like, but I had a team that probably spent like over 100 hours on that and it just wasn't worth the, the lift. Like, it was just do it on, do that part on, on EC2. Um, you know, the, um, the, the image bakery pattern, this can be really simple overall. Um, you know, there's a little bit, there's a little bit of stuff here where you want, if you're, especially if you're using Docker uh, to do the, the image bakery, you need to pass uh, access keys into it via environment variables, and then you know the there's this little stanza here which transforms the environment variables into packer variables. Uh, so you know, I I built this on T2 larges. So when I was actually baking, I have I had this I had the playbook. All together at one point, where I would just installed this image, and you know, I, I, I did different things based on whether it was came back as EC2 or Vagrant, and it was working great when I had everything baked together here. Okay, you know, like how it's supposed to go is like this. Okay, but this is what I was getting because of that one point of thing. Multiple playbook entry points. I'm just going to show that here real quick. So these multiple playbook entry points, you know, are named after the code deploy phases. You know, I've got like after install and start server. The one that's for a cloud init is named cloud init YML. Like it just could be really hard to keep track of all of this. And you know, this is a relatively simple example. This could get a lot more complex if you're trying to. to build something that had like 10 different applications that all needed slightly different build configurations. Um, okay, so have folks work with code deploy at all? No? Okay. I mean, it's very fiddly, okay? Um, the new console, which I just really started playing with today, is makes it a little less fiddly, and uh, it actually has uh, the one thing in it that it was totally missing before, which is the, uh, the 
the skip application stop failure checkbox in there. So that's like, there's this worst thing, like this, this system is really great, except, <coughs> except if, you're, if your deployment failed and application stopped, okay? There's like a safety check. It's like, well, if you couldn't stop your application, we don't know what might be going on, so we're gonna make you, you know, investigate. But unfortunately, the only, the only uh, way that, um, the only way that, that you could actually um, uh, like do this before and tell it to ignore application stop failure was by using like eight raw API calls with the command line. So you could not come into the, the UE and do it. Um, but now they finally have surfaced the checkbox. Like, yay! Okay. Um, this is especially bad if, if you get into a state where like things are not deploying and then the instances are failing your health checks and they're rebooting over and over again. Like, you know, code deploy is, is nice, but like it has some dark corners in it too that you really have to watch out for. And being able to do this and like deploy and you know and go through this is one of the things that can, can help that from going going boom. Alright, I think I've shown the, the, the basic points in there for all of the individual tips here. So I'm gonna continue um, with the presentation. All right, so in the, the biggest project I worked on with this had, you know, a lot of stuff going on. You can see there's, you know, 172 running instances here, you know, in the, in the AWS um, account that, that this thing was targeting. Um, and when, when we were using this, um, like there were a lot of changes that would go through, you know, like, uh, you know, Dozens and dozens of different Terraform changes got planned. You know, and sometimes we would we would like redo things so that we we had to re rebake our image uh, and then totally redo the way we were deploying a bunch of applications. So like massive amounts of changes got through here. But being able to have that baseline image really made it a lot easier to uh, to have something solid to work with. Um, so. You know, this is just a really large environment, and the bakery pattern, like, it was just a bedrock of this. We, we knocked that out really early in the engagement. It made everything else much easier. So all, this, all the variability we handled with code deploy, and then the, uh, you know, it just, just made, it, made it so much easier. Okay. Um, having code review in here is also something I would really strongly recommend, and, you know, use the same tools that you do for your workflow in hardcore software development for the, the DevOps stuff, infrastructure as code should have just the same same basic stuff for it. And the linting tools, uh, the basic diagram of how this works, uh, you know, local dev with um, with Ansible in a CentOS box, a Vagrant running it, uh, Docker running Packer um, will start up EC2 instance, and then run Ansible on the remote host. Ansible local. Yeah. Uh, CI environment uh, works like this, very similar. Uh, you know, and this is the legacy transition pattern. So uh, these slides are already up on my uh, attached to my LinkedIn. So okay. So this was one of the lessons learned, of course. I waited a little too long to get some of the cool stuff in here. There's a few more things that I can demo here, and we can try to fix one of the problems. I think that might be might be good. Are folks up for that? Are there yeah. any questions before I dig into some of that? Uh, on your uh, running um, Terraform, like you're not running Ansible on Docker, so it's Terraform and Packer, right? Or do you have well, Ansible on Docker? Because because I'm because it's so Packer ends up running in you know, through Docker, yeah. and Packer starts up an EC2 instance and then installs Ansible on it with a simple shell script. So like Ansible is not running in a Dockerized way. Okay, like Ansible ends up running in the host, yeah. however that goes. Any other questions before we try to fix this thing? <clears throat> okay. No, sorry, I had a question yeah. about the temp. Directly. Is it just the Ansible provisioner that gives you that problem? Well, a 
lots of scripts, you know, may use the temp directory as a dumping place. If you okay. execute something in temp, you just shouldn't do that, like, yeah. you, because it's, you know, it's a bad pattern that has led to so many security problems over the last 40 years. Right. So if you see but, something that does it, yeah, but it's not the the uh, Ansible engine itself. No, the temp directory. Ansible doesn't yeah. care about that. It's yeah. just that the tooling that's built up around it. Yeah. So okay. Because right. I know there's a config. For that, yeah, where you can point yeah, it. That's, you can. That's kind of why I asked whether yeah. it's a local provisioner versus a remote. So okay. they they have two separate provisioners. One of them is, like he says, with the local one, which copies the playbook and runs it over there, versus the other one, which is much more, the remote provisioner is much more like very similar to how Ansible playbook will run. We run it locally yeah. on desktop, and it's SSH into the remote host and runs all the instructions. Right? Right. And that definitely, I definitely know that there is a, Variable you can tweak that. Yeah. But he was talking about the previous one. That's what I was just showing. Yep. So, I mean, the default is to use temp with a lot of these tools, and you just need to find the option that says don't do it that way because yeah. it's going to bite you with the I don't know, I would see eventually. Yeah. I'm saying Ansible itself, its default is to put a dot Ansible in your home directory. Yeah. And that works and work great. Out of there. And I actually had a problem where the home directory was on NFS, so it was very slow to put things there. So yeah, you don't want to do I that. I switched either. to slash temp instead. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I had to, I, 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 when I was trying to get this going, I had to figure out now which dot Ansible directory is it, you know? So there's a funny maneuver in one of these files uh, with the, uh, uh, oh, with the, the Terraform. The cloud in it. Okay. You see this funny maneuver here? Sudo to CentOS and then run Ansible Playbook. So this runs as root. Okay. But, you know, the first time I ran it, I'm like, you can't find the playbooks. Well, I'm like, the playbooks got installed when the image was baked. I'm like, oh, they're not in slash root dot Ansible. They're in slash home slash CentOS dot Ansible. So, Keeping track of that stuff is good. Okay, so fixing this problem. Oh, go ahead. Just a quick question. If it's a bit of topic, we can talk afterwards. But according to those guidelines, if you're not supposed to be using them, how are you supposed to execute stuff? Uh, you copy it to some other directory that's that it's not going to be on no exec, no SUID. So copy some, it to, some other directory. Yeah. There is no like, defined. There's no, no defined thing. You okay. can put it in slash home slash something or other. You can put it in slash op slash you know, downloads. Okay, or you know, uh, pick a convention for your application and stick with it. Uh, it's just like the temp thing, like has caused no end of pain for me. It's just you know, like I dodged that here by by commenting out the part that locks it down because I know that there's like a couple more hours worth of work to eradicate all of the slash temps once I do that. So, so it sounds like the Galaxy people who write Galaxy roles should have some standardized variable for. Attempt directly. There should be. And I'm not aware of one. It doesn't mean it's yeah. not out there. Well, so that's what that? Tim was trying to say. Right, yeah. I think there is one. It's just not, I need to check it. It's not used in a lot of places where it yeah. should be. Well, it would require reading the manual, so. Right, right. people don't read, yeah. so. Well, no. you, could, you, could not, you could have some GitHub thing not accept the roles that they have hard coded slash temp in them. You could. You could write all kinds of different linters for that. That could be like, um, I mean, uh, I can't remember, like, how much linting do we have baked into Ansible at this point? It is itself. Now Ansible linter. Okay. Um, I, is that beta or is that out publicly? Like, uh, it, it's, it's been in the community for a few years. We just migrated it to the Ansible account oh, okay. a couple okay. weeks ago. Okay. And there's a 4.0 coming in a week or so, which is a lot of big changes we wanted to make. Okay, cool. So, so like, there's something there that's yeah. something much better in the coming weeks. Yeah, like so. if you can detect in that that something is using temp when maybe it shouldn't, should use something else, that would be awesome. Um, so, like, the, I, I'm a big fan of linting all the things, yeah. you know, like, like this thing has a, a, a Terraform format linting, so if you haven't run Terraform FMT on your stuff, it'll just blow up, you know. <laughs> um, uh, I think it has a, a shell check linting in it, too files run through Docker. Shell, shell check and bash unofficial strict mode, you will see a lot of that in these shell scripts. So this, this like has the, this, the state of the art is like what I've learned in the last 20 years of, of shell scripting, and especially in the last five since I discovered bash unofficial strict mode and shell check. Um, those things are awesome. 
Um, okay, so how are we going to fix this? So we have an unexpected variance in what we're getting in the runtime. So we could either fix our expression, or we could fix what machine we're doing that should revert to the old behavior. So what, what's the problem? I'm not okay. sure. I'll show you. So um, what, what, what was going on um, is, um, okay. Need to get to the code so it's actually uh, in, in there. Let's see, where is it? Get here. Okay. So the specific problem here, it took it took a while to figure out where all these stupid logs were. Oh no, did I just get pumped out of there because it's rotating the image? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is also typical with like troubleshooting auto scaling groups. Sort of Actually, stuff. that's that's a pretty good point, which is you you want to turn off one of the life cycles of ter terminate. You, yeah. You could do that. Like I just I I kicked this off and this particular Jenkins file like. You know, even if you um, even if it has a timeout here, um, it, it, and if you tell it to do the rotate, it just goes ahead anyway. So mm -hmm. like that's something I gotta fix too. Uh, what is, so one thing I, I would maybe try to do is like you know uh, run the setup module against your destination host and try to look at all the facts and see if there's like a new a new thing that might identify uh, the Amazon specific host. Ooh, okay, um, let's uh, let's go in there and I'm um, so the, right now it's on a T3 small. Um, so let's take a look at what's actually the current ones. It's got a couple, like that one's shutting down, but this one, this one is brand new and shiny, I think. It still says status checks and initializing. So by, like, it takes a long time for some of these things to actually fully initialize. So we'll go ahead and, yeah, I've got a little, uh, a little maze so that I can get to these instances from my Jenkins server, but not like, uh, you know, from the web generally, you know, SSH locked down. Um, that way is pretty good. Um, like, there's other things you can do, but this is good enough, you know, for, for demo purposes. Okay, so so let's take a look real quick at the the specific thing that that was failing here. Okay, now code deploy dumps the deployments for this. Uh, GUID directory, and then it has the deployment IDs, and then there's the logs bit here. Okay. So when I was messing with this a little earlier, I dumped this just one this one thing here. Okay, like this Ansible BIOS version because it wasn't what I expected. So I just you know the good old like you know print a debug statement technique. So you're saying that I can do some. Some command here and yeah, just you do it like a, yeah, just a run Ansible with uh, using the dash M flag, just uh, set up uh, the module setup, and uh, yeah, you have to do this here. Localhost. Uh, dash L local or yeah. dash localhost. What that will do is that will return a JSON object of all the discovered facts from the instance. Um, I'm gonna do it like yeah. no, just, just take out the dash local after yeah, Ansible. Like that? Yeah, that. Yep. Yeah. No L. <laughs> no L? Oh, just L. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Right. So now you get all of these facts. Right. So these are the things that will happen. Assuming you. Oh, hey, look at this. Facts, There's right. Ansible system vendor. There you go. All right. That looks pretty good. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Okay. So let's do the same command here and see if we have uh, something that is um, that is distinguishable um, in our vagrant environment because that's that's the big trick there. So. Okay. I believe this is the I, one. I think there's temp directory facts in there too. I was trying to run it from my phone to check. <laughs> okay. So there you have it. Uh, Virtualization so cool. type virtual box, for instance. Um, I don't see a vendor. Yeah. So, so we've got the up farther. Virtualization type virtual box. That's pretty good. Uh, this is. So this is interesting. This is like, K I mean, we could just switch it on on KVM versus VirtualBox because really, like, 
But you know, the other one is probably not. The other one is Zen is the problem. So yep. If you're using the older yeah. versions, it's going to probably be Zen, Zen or HTML. Yeah. yeah so. That's right. So, um, so I could put it in the OR statement. Yeah. You know. Um, so, you know, OR Ansible system vendor equals or it contains Amazon, Amazon or something. Or, yeah. Yeah. Like let's. So you could do uh, Amazon in Ansible system vendor or you know virtual box in. The BIOS or something like that. I like this. I like making it flexible here. So let's see if we can make it backward compatible so it'll work with both. So maybe, uh, okay. So that's going to be in Ansible roles. Uh, it's in the um, app after install tasks thing. Okay. So can I do just like this? Uh, no. Is that the right syntax? Uh, let's see. Is it or or is it the double box? Yeah, I, don't I think it's or. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's or. Fairly yeah, and, and we can test it really fast too. That's one of the beautiful things here is I've already got that command queued up to test this in VirtualBox. Uh, it's Python. Ansible's going to use the Python set instructions. Okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe or. Yeah. PyPy was actually, It's actually Jinja 2, but Jinja 2, Jinja two is, is Python. Pythonic. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah, Jinja 2 is great. Uh, I love Jinja 2. Uh, that, that massive cloud deployment used Jinja 2 super extensively for all kinds of config file manipulation. <coughs> we had Jinja 2 config files. Uh, just, just really quick, I was wondering if you wanted to put the Amazon thing in the EC2 variable. Um, like other than the virtual box one. Oh yeah, yeah. It's totally in the wrong place, isn't it? Okay. Just out of the blue, is there any way to debug a Jinja 2 template when it crashes and you just it just prints out a problem in the template and it prints out a string called showing the whole template? Is um, there an easy way to tell where the heck it was in the template? I, uh, I don't know off the top okay. of my head. Like, I, I, I know think you've seen this by now. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure I've seen it and I'm probably just like, and just solved it by inspection brute force most of the time. Commenting out things. I, I, yeah, I don't. I don't remember the exact thing. Yeah, like binary search on like comment out half the template until you know the darn thing <laughs> parses. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, even if you turn on uh, debugging and try to get the variables, it can still be a little hairy trying yeah. to figure it out. Yeah, I didn't um, see any uh, easy way to. It's only with the line number in the template, but it's processing the template as a single string. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's see. If it, uh, let's run, let's run the, uh, <coughs> all right, so I'm just going to run this to make sure that it doesn't blow up. Okay, it didn't blow up, that's good. Yay. I didn't expect it to, but you know. That's why we have slow tests. That's right. I, I always like to do that before doing the commit and push. Yeah. Uh. My 
CI should kick off and it should, uh, it, right now it's creating a new code deploy file on every build. So this should just do it, you know. Uh, I, I can also, you know, I can also do a code, uh, code deploy bin build, you know, so it'll do it here too, so. You know, if you're using Jenkins, it's nice to have the build number in there. It's also nice to have a git commit hash in there, um, especially if you mix and match some of these things. It's just less confusing. Um, this one finished first, so I'll just grab that URL. Um, a fully developed pipeline for this would have not only like building it, but also doing the code deploy. And I've, I've built pipelines like that that use Jenkins jobs where it uses a selector where it actually looks at the successfully completed jobs for a different build job and lets you, you know, like do a little drop down search for the build that you want to deploy, which is super, super nice also. Mm -hmm. But that's not built into this uh, thing, right? Right now, this is like a separate thing. The code deploy bits are not actually built into this repo today either, but uh, they will be very shortly because I'm really angry at this particular repo. <laughs> I gotta put it in there. It's like, I feel like it's not as it's not as operational as some of the stuff that I've built uh, you know, for uh, the, the big engagements yet. So, uh, and that, this is just one of those things where you know, if, if you've done work and the customer owns it lock, stock, and barrel, that's, that's great. You can't go look at their code and copy and paste, but you know, um, you know, as, as long, as, uh, as, long as you, you have a way of re kind of redoing some stuff from first principles, you know, it's a great way of kind of like getting stuff out into the open. Um, we do a lot of that at our, at our company, where we we learn from the um, we learn from like the, the customer engagement stuff, and then we plow it back into open source later. You know, once we're frustrated that we don't have all that great stuff that we once had access to, and we're off the project. Um, okay, so all we got to do is deploy this, and it should. Fix it. <clears throat> All right. Code deploy can be very long and frustrating, but they have included, improved this quite a bit in that it looks like now. Um, when you hook up code deploy to the load balancer, it'll automatically uh, like stop traffic to, in the load balancer. There's a set of, of scripts that were very, very flaky that Amazon has out there that you could integrate. You know, if they would put your nodes into standby, and that would remove things from the load balancer. But it had very funky math, and it looks like they fixed it in the tool itself now, so that when when you do the deployment, it'll take it out of the load balancer for you, and you don't have to, to lift a finger anymore, which is fantastic, because that was one of the worst parts if you had like 30 nodes out there, you know, like, let's say you've got like 30 big honking like, you know, C4, 4XL machines serving production traffic, and you have to do the big deploy, okay, with code deploy, and you do half at once. You know, and you keep your CPU utilization around 40%. You've got enough traffic to do it. But if like third of your deployments fail because there's some weird race with you know how many instances am I keeping track of because of that stupid script, you could have a bad day. It's pretty advisable. <laughs> yeah. Alright. But this one it looks like it's working there. I mean, for doing stuff like this in, in Dev too, like this is set up with one at a time, but really I probably ought to have done like all at once, uh, just to speed things up a bit. Uh, but that's not that's not the default for for this one, and I didn't override it when I did that build. That went super smoothly. This one, yeah, there's like five or six more hooks in here. Than there were there were in the old uh, the old code deploy. So I I think I haven't worked with the stuff with 
ECS or with Lambda with code deploy, but I have a feeling that once they got things into that realm, they're like, this is garbage and we have to fix this. <laughs> That's just, their two pizza team came through in this case. So. All right. All right, so that is deployed. What, or is it pending? Well, I should be able to come in here, even if that other one isn't in. And if I reload, didn't <laughs> okay, so you know, back to the drawing board. This is it. This is like yeah. this iterative process about like you, you know, you look at stuff, you try to figure out what's going on, um, and this is almost certainly like it didn't set the SE Linux permissions on that directory as expected. You know? So like this is locked down that hard. So it does take extra effort. You know, the classic answer with most system administrators is just disable SE Linux and move on, right? Yeah. But you know, that way uh, can really open you up to a broader class of attacks. So. I remember spending half a day trying to figure out SC Linux roles instead of doing that. Yeah. So just to say, yeah. And this is permissive. <laughs> no. yeah. um, so uh, the other thing that we could try to do um, is fix it uh, the other way. Um, so just for giggles, let's uh, Let's look at the Terraform variables. And instead of T3 small, let's go to T2 small. Um, or even uh, T2, let's do T2 large. Because that's what was working when I provisioned it elsewhere. Um, I could also have done this um, directly in um, in my CI uh, tool because I've got an override, and I could just change that variable straight in there. Okay. So, so in this case, we're going to do a Terraform deploy and rotate the instances. So, I Terraform, solve the captcha. I screwed up the simple addition problem too many times to count, um, and we're going to rotate the servers. The worst one is a multiplication problem uh, in anywhere between <laughs> one and twelve. Uh, people have trouble with their twelve times tables. Turns out this is like the, the fifth or sixth time I've built a capture kind of like that, but now it's free. So, and you you could not build a capture just like that with the Jenkins uh, DSL that's more yeah. hand. So you, you know. Now, has anybody worked with Jenkins X, done stuff with that? Because that looks kind of interesting, but I haven't played with it yet. That's more of a like, Kubernetes, cloud native you know, flavor to it. Okay. So, um, all this is going to do is change our launch configuration. Uh, we we did a, a new bake, uh, bake operation, so it has a new AMI, and it's going to change from T3 small to T2 large. Um, and I think we're in good shape, so we'll go ahead and apply it. Now, like this kind of cycle here um, is, you know, if, if you look at um, the demo videos for, for Oshicorp and their uh, their Terraform like host product, like this review cycle is like the key feature. <laughs> okay, it's like, yeah. well, you get to look at the changes before you apply them. And it does basically the same thing. Yeah. So I hadn't actually seen that until recently. And I just watched a YouTube video mm -hmm. uh, on it. I'm like, oh hey, that's just like that cycle that we built in CI, you know. Um, so um, while we, you know, hopefully have success, does anybody else kind of have any other other questions, either yeah. about you know the approach or pitfalls? So, for me, I'm I'm kind of curious. Um, so it seems like you kind of broken down your roles sort of on tasks and stuff like that. Um, do you find that that's a, a a pretty generic kind of pattern to use? So just as an example, I, I typically do my roles more about like kind of defining the state of the application and then. 
kind of let Ansible and Terraform do all of its things together, but you kind of lose out maybe on some orchestration uh, potential there. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're building a bunch of reusable components, it makes sense to, to break out the roles really, really fine grain. Yeah. Okay, like just have it be per software component. But when you're trying to do these integration things, you almost inevitably have at least one kind of like grab bag mm -hmm. role that just has a, a tasks file that stitches all of it together. That's mm -hmm. just what I've seen. Okay. You know? And you know, it, it, because you can mm -hmm. stitch all these roles together into different playbooks in different ways, or even invoke you know multiple playbooks at once, it gives you just a lot of flexibility. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like the the vagrant invocation of this, it invokes. The, the bakery playbook, and then it invokes the uh, after install hook and the application start hooks, so that it's as if code deploy has just run. Right. It, it, you know, with the vagrant thing, there's no process of like downloading the code. So I just assume hmm, if I have the code in the exact same places where I would put it, you know, in the instances here, then I can just run those two scripts, and you know, things will be happy and alive at the end. Yeah. Um, so, and that's good stuff. Um, the validation is one of the other great things about the, the code deploy. You know, like, it's not so much Ansible specific, but um, the validate. Like, here's a super simple one where we just, we just curl, you know, a, a URL, and if it exit code's good, then, then we're good. Yeah. Um, but for some of these things, like, I've seen, I've seen, um, some health checks for some of these services like that are super complex. Like you can use things like a cookie cutter pattern where you actually install five or six different applications on the same node. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that, that can that can make your deployments a bit simpler. Uh, you know, and you can just run one auto scaling group. You know, especially if, if before like you've had uh, you know like a, a front end and an API server and, Scaling them independently has been challenging. Just mm -hmm. point the front end of the API server on localhost. It's going to be light and fast to make those calls, mm -hmm. and you're going to have to scale up one group, you know, anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, the more stuff you pile into the cookie, like the more unwieldy it gets to deploy. Yeah. But you know, uh, that can be a pretty good model. And but if you have if you've done that, you might need to do a check here that spawns five different threads that check five different services and then fail when one of them fails. Right. Immediately, yeah, you know, so like it, it can get more complex. It's just balancing this this thing about like how complex does it have to be, right. um, and like what operational efficiency am I going to get? Just this constant push and pull. Yeah, I think it's really important to highlight that because there's no one size fits all or sort of killer way to do this, right? No, it really isn't. What is, what's in front of you? What tools do you have? And what constraints, right? So it's a really good analysis. Uh, there we go. Yeah. All right, so those are terminating, and it might work. Yeah. Woohoo! Oh, okay, oh, hey. here we go. Ah! Did uh, one of them work? <laughs> one's working. I don't know why one of them worked and the other one didn't. That's really interesting. Gold there. I think the uh, load balancer uh, <laughs> might be giving us one instance in the other. Yeah. Just for a second, it was working kind of so okay, nice. and it went boom. Yeah, it was just awesome. Tough. All right. Well, thank you, thank you so this much, is, Richard. This is how it goes. Really excited. Oh, um, yeah. So, you know, thanks again, Richard. Um, so you said you have the links of this on your LinkedIn. Yep. Um, awesome. So if anybody has any questions, uh, Connie will hopefully post a video before the end of the week if you guys are interested. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to just reach out to us on the meetup. We can put you in touch with Richard, or if you have any other questions, that'd be yep. awesome. So again, thanks everybody for coming out. Uh, so cold. <laughs> I want to be like I had a presentation today from somebody from Denmark, and who was talking about how in in the Arctic uh, they you know they have this whole com notion of like warm and cozy, and I was like that's what I need tonight. But we're all here. So thanks for coming out, and um, uh, hope to see you probably next year. Um, uh, so it's, you know, it's December, but uh, the last call is, this doesn't happen without you, and that, that doesn't just mean you showing up. Uh, if you have something that you want to talk about, something you want to show off, talk about a problem that you have, and you don't have to have an answer, but we can't do this without people like you being willing to come up and kind of talk about the work that you've done. Um, it doesn't have to be an hour, it could be a 15 minute talk, we can get a few of them together, but we really need more. 
from you uh, as much as you can and as much as you're willing to. But I know that all of you guys are doing amazing, cool stuff, and I want to find out more about it. So if you think about it early next year, you come up with an idea. It doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be complicated. It could just be an aha moment. It could be something you spent hours working on you want to tell everyone else about. Come here and show it to everyone if you could. So hope everyone has a great holidays, Hanukkah and Christmas and New Year um, and all, all holidays. And, you know, travel safe and, and uh, spend time with friends and family. So thank you, everyone. Connie, do you have anything to add? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so definitely the speaker thing is, 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 a, is a big deal. So um, we are, I'm trying really hard not to ask Tim for like speakers every single time. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and Ansible's very nice, it has very nice they yeah, like, yeah, yeah, they kinda leave us alone. Us, but uh, I really want this to be about us. We're the users, we're the groups yeah. here working together and, and getting to know each other. So um would we, really be awesome. And then if you don't want to speak but you have some other ways you might want to help out, we're always helping too. Maybe you have a space, maybe you wanna buy some food or drinks. Um, if your company wants to help out, we have like we'll find a way to put your logo on the meetup and stuff, and give you a little recognition. So, any way you can help out, we'll, we'll take it. Yep. Great. So thanks again, Richard. It was yep. really awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great.